This is Dr. David Jans. He is home critical care medicine at University Medical Center in New Orleans. We had our first COVID positive ICU patient on March 10th, and we currently have about 50 COVID positive or PUI patients in the intensive care unit. We have seen very good extubation numbers ranging in the 40% area here at our hospital. And we wanted to share some of what Dr. Jans and our critical care folk have been doing as well as our entire hospital that we think might be part of the reason we're getting some better outcomes than are reported elsewhere. So uh, like Dr. Mackey said, uh, our first patients in the ICU started rolling in around March 10th. Uh, and now we get to today, which is April 1st, and all the work that has occurred in between then and now uh, to try to help these patients and help them survive their critical illness. Uh, in back on March 10th and then the coming days after March 10th, uh, we at UMC and particularly me and, and a few other ICU doctors witnessed a huge influx in uh, critical care uh, patients. Um, and uh, just the severity of illness that these patients had, the number of these patients that came into our ICU, um, how quickly they were coming in. Uh, it, was, it was unprecedented in our hospital and perhaps even in critical care around the world. Um, and at the time seemed uh, overwhelming and maybe even insurmountable in regards to the amount of critical care that was, that was coming into our ICUs. And now we get to today, uh, where we've developed what I think is manageable critical care that where we're able to move these patients through the ICU, most of these patients through the ICU safely, efficiently, getting uh, most of these patients better, uh, either not even having to intubate some of them or uh, the ones that do get intubated, being able to extubate them um, and, uh, and, and keeping as much stress off of our ICUs as possible. We can't save all these patients. We try our best to save all these patients, and it just doesn't doesn't work out sometimes, despite our best efforts. But I think uh, we've transitioned from being overwhelmed by the amount of critical care that's coming in to being able to manage this. And what what has not occurred between March 10th and April 1st is there still is no known treatment for this viral infection. Uh, there isn't a drug that we know of that treats this virus. There's lots of drugs that, that get talked about uh, amongst healthcare providers and in the media of things that maybe people are trying. We have no idea if any of those drugs work. And, uh, and we still don't today. But somehow we've able to, to go from March 10th to April 1st uh, and turn our system into a, a system that can manage a, a large influx of very sick patients do it efficiently and uh, save lives along this. And the way that we've, we've done this over the past few weeks in the ICU at UMC uh, is basically be, be good stewards of evidence-based medicine. So like I said, we don't have a drug that we know will treat this viral infection, but we have lots of ICU interventions that we know treat the symptoms and the critical illness that this vir viral infection causes. So we don't have a drug that yet that will eradicate this virus, but the illness that it causes, the, syn the critical illness syndrome that it causes, we have lots of evidence-based therapies to treat that. And that's what we've spent weeks basically focusing on, perfecting, uh, and getting incredibly good at providing these evidence-based interventions uh, to all of these patients as best we can and that is truly what has changed between March 10th and April 1st, is just being incredibly good at providing evidence-based critical care. Uh, and let's start with a timeline over here uh, on the left side of the screen where a patient comes into the ICU and then we're gonna travel all the way across this timeline to the patient now uh, being better and being discharged from the ICU. When patients come into the ICU, uh, these patients all present with some degree of respiratory failure. But there's a, a fair number of patients who don't need to be intubated for this respiratory failure. They can be supported with non-invasive 
uh, non-invasive respiratory support devices, um, such as things like BiPAP, uh, cannulas, nasal cannulas, uh, high flow nasal cannulas, that can support the patient who uh, who doesn't isn't sick enough to require intubation, and we've probably uh, a ballpark estimate we've probably gotten about 15 or so patients through their ICU stay without ever having to intubate them uh, using these other support devices. Um, the majority of the patients get intubated because they are markedly hypoxemic and when they present, they look incredibly ill and it perhaps just wouldn't be safe to try these devices. But there's a good number of patients too that never need to be intubated and we can help them through their ICU stay without an endotracheal tube. And uh, specifically these devices that I've listed here on the screen, the Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, has uh, the same society that produced uh, the surviving sepsis guidelines. Uh, also recommends using these devices to help support patients during uh, their ICU stay, either to prevent intubation or to prevent re-intubation after they've been extubated. So this is a, a group of patients down here on the left that we can help without an tracheal tube. But like I said, most uh, do require an tracheal tube, and that gets us to uh, the first of a few different evidence-based interventions that we've been pr providing to these patients. Uh, and that is applying the results of what is called the ARMA trial, uh, which was a trial of patients with ARDS, as almost all of these patients with COVID have ARDS. The ARMA, ARMA trial was a trial comparing tidal volumes, providing tidal volumes to these patients of uh, six versus 12 cc's per kilo of predicted body weight when they're on the ventilator. Uh, and six cc's per kilo, the patients that got randomized to six cc's per kilo of predicted body weight tidal volumes uh, had a significantly uh, increased survival in that trial. Um, and so we, in the ICU and treating these patients, uh, we are good stewards of this evidence and we try to do this perfectly. Uh, we calculate patients' predicted, predicted body weights, which is based on, on your genetic sex and your height. It is not, not dependent on what your current weight is. This is a predicted body weight. We calculate the predicted body weight. We multiply that by six, and that's the tidal volume that we dial in for these patients. If there isn't time to uh, calculate patients' predicted body weights, or you just haven't looked up a calculator because it's tough to memorize that formula, uh, a, a quick rule of thumb is uh, for women, if you start with a tidal volume of 360 and men, if you start with a tidal volume of 420, you're right almost 90% of the time without having to uh, do any calculations. And then when you have time later, you can, uh, you can do some calculations and dial in that tidal volume uh, more perfectly. So that's the first thing we do to the, the intubated patient. Uh, the second thing uh, we do, again, based on evidence, is uh, dial in high PEEP. Uh, this is based on, on a meta-analysis of three randomized trials of high versus low PEEP for patients who have severe ARDS, as uh, a large majority of these patients do, where if we provide them higher amounts of PEEP on the ventilator, there perhaps is a survival benefit to using higher amounts of PEEP. Uh, and we uh, will go up to as, as high as as high as 24 of PEEP uh, using the ARDSnet, high PEEP lab. Uh, this, it's, it's not able to be memorized, this high PEEP ladder, but it's publicly available and part of our protocol that you basically just look at how much FiO2 the patient's requiring, and then it tells you what amount of PEEP that the patient should receive for that, that corresponding FiO2. Uh, and then um, you dial up the PEEP, and again, using uh, much higher levels of PEEP than traditionally are used, and as, as high as uh, 24 of PEEP. Once this is done, once we've applied high PEEP, uh, we, we calculate uh, what someone's SAO2, 
the FiO2 ratio is. And if this ratio is less than 150, uh, then we prone the patient. We use prone positioning. Uh, this is based on what was called the PROCEVA trial, where in patients with severe ARDS who had a, this, where this ratio was less than 150 uh, within the first 24 hours, um, and so we're going to call this uh, early proning. If the patient, after you put them on the vent, you've dialed in the correct tidal volume, you've applied an appropriate amount of PEEP. If that patient's uh, still markedly hypoxemic as measured by an SAO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 150, uh, then we prone these patients. And on average, uh, it's 16 hours in the prone position and eight hours supine. And we do this uh, over and over again until the patient's SF ratio is greater than the 150 in the supine position. And on average, in the PROCEVA trial, on average, those patients with severe ADS required this cycle of proning and supining about four and a half times. I'd say in our experience with our patients with COVID, uh, it's actually turned out to be fewer than four and a half cycles of proning and supining. It's probably in the range of more two or three and then the patient is usually then better and not requiring prone positioning anymore. While these patients uh, are on the ventilator and sick, uh, if, if they have another indication to receive steroids, then they receive steroids. They don't receive steroids just for the indication of having only ARDS. Uh, it's, it's debatable whether or not we should be treating ARDS with steroids, uh, but if there are certain patient populations who, who have comorbidities that may be steroid responsive, then get infected with COVID and develop ARDS, those patients are, are much more likely to benefit from steroids. And those are patients, for example, with COPD, asthma, chronic steroids, uh, and patients with refractory shock. So in other words, if this patient with COVID has ARDS uh, and, uh, and one of these other problems, either a comorbidity like COPD, asthma, or they're on chronic steroids, or with their COVID, they have refractory septic shock to vasopressors, uh, we give that patient steroids. If they have none of those things, uh, we have not been giving that patient steroids. Another uh, a piece of evidence that we've been applying while these patients, especially while these patients are on the ventilator, uh, is a trial in critical care and caring for patients with ARDS that was called the FACT trial. Uh, this stands for the Fluid and Catheter Treatment Trial, uh, which basically showed that in patients who are not in refractory shock, who have ARDS or not in shock at all, uh, that if you add diuresis, Uh, these patients will get off the ventilator about two days sooner than if you did not diurese them. Uh, so we are, are very conservative uh, about giving these patients any fluids at all. In fact, we err on the side of not giving them any, any uh, fluid resuscitation unless they just have overt signs that patients are, are very volume depleted when they arrive first in the ICU. And those patients do exist. I'd say there's been probably half a dozen patients so far total who've arrived and, and just show some overt sign of volume depletion. And then immediately on arrival, we do volume resuscitate those patients with, with balanced crystalloid fluids like lactated ringers or plasmolite, but not saline. Uh, but um, if the patient doesn't present with marked signs of volume depletion and they just present with signs of severe hypoxic respiratory failure, uh, from the beginning and then through their entire ICU stay, we apply the results of the, the FACT trial, uh, and we, we try to actively diurese these patients with, with Lasix. Uh, and again, that evidence suggests they'd get off the ventilator two days quicker than if you did nothing to them or if you gave them more fluids. Uh, 
Uh, on average, if you do nothing to an ICU patient, especially an ARDS patient in the ICU, if you do nothing to them, just their routine ICU care will make them get net positive about a liter a day. So if you never give them Lasix, all you do is just are giving them meds, drips, et cetera, they'll get a liter net positive a day on average, and that probably isn't good for patients with hypoxic respiratory failure with ARDS. And so you have to actively do something to treat that, that all that volume that's gonna go in with routine ICU care and maybe diuresis uh, is the answer to that, and the, and the, the evidence from the fact trial would suggest that's the case. Uh, some uh, quick tricks on how to do this. Uh, if you multiply the patient's creatinine by 40, uh, that's the dose of Lasix you should give the patient. And then we dose it at a frequency of twice a day. So if the patient's creatinine is two, you should give that patient 80 of IV Lasix twice a day, and that will usually achieve at least net, net even fluid balance or a net negative fluid balance, which would be even better. When, uh, when these patients are finally better, um, they, uh, and their hypoxemia is better, we're able to then wake them up and hopefully extubate them. So usually along this entire timeline here, patients uh, are usually deeply sedated because they're markedly hypoxemic. If they're getting prone positioning, then neuromuscular blockade's been added to their deep sedation. But uh, again, lots of these folks will get better in, in two or three days, and you're able to get rid of a lot of this stuff, including their neuromuscular blockade and deep sedation, uh, which brings us to the ventilation liberation part of, of this timeline and applying the evidence and specifically here the evidence that's applied uh, is something from something called the ABC trial which says uh, when patients are better when you when you've taken them through this entire timeline of critical care uh, and they're better with from their hypoxemia that you should start doing something called spontaneous awakening and spontaneous breathing trials where once a day uh, you just wake them up, you turn off all their sedation, and when you turn off all their sedation, you put them on a mode of ventilation that allows them to spontaneously breathe. The mode of ventilation we use here is pressure support, where we dial in a pressure support of, on average, about five, a PEEP uh, of around five, and an FiO2 of 40%. Uh, and we see whether or not patients pass the spontaneous breathing trial. The passing criteria for spontaneous breathing trials, uh, it's a long list. It's difficult to remember. I, it can be summed up what passing means in a spontaneous breathing trial is basically the patient doesn't fall apart when they're, on, when they're spontaneously breathing on this minimal amount of support. That's what spon passing a spontaneous awakening and breathing trial means. And if this patient passes, uh, then we extubate them. And so now we've made it all the way to the end of this. Uh, where the patient gets extubated. Um, if this patient fails the spontaneous breathing trial because they're breathing very fast, because they're desaturating, uh, we've actually added another step here that is evidence-based that can help patients get extubated, uh, and that is uh, on pressure support, uh, increasing the amount of pressure support while they're still on the ventilator, so that you can decide what BiPAP settings am I gonna extubate this patient to. So not to keep the patient on the ventilator, but we'll turn up the pressure support or the PEEP, for example, if the patient's failing a spontaneous breathing trial. We'll see what, what settings then make them pass that spontaneous breathing trial. And then, then we know what BiPAP settings to extubate the patient to. This is also based on uh, some amount of evidence that suggests they're uh, in patients in the ICU who have high are high risk for reintubation, and these patients would be at high risk for reintubation. That if you extubate them to BiPAP, uh, those patients are much less likely to require reintubation, and so we've been using BiPAP a lot. So uh, we see BiPAP here both in the back end to prevent reintubation. We see it on the front end to prevent intubation.
at all. Uh, we've been using to do BiPAP safely in these patients. We've been using uh, our Puritan Bennett 980 ventilators and uh, our V60 BiPAP ventilators because these can do closed circuit BiPAP with an inline viral filter so that the patient, when they're breathing with BiPAP, they're not just exhaling their breath into the room. They exhale their breath through a viral filter first to uh, minimize any uh, dispersion of virus into the room, minimize it as much as possible. And that basically takes us through uh, the timeline of, of bringing an ICU patient with COVID and ARDS through their entire ICU stay. And now I'll hand it back to Dr. Mackey and, uh, and see if he has any questions for me. Thanks, Dr. Jan, that's perfect. Uh, a couple questions that have come from other docs. Um, one, are you proning any patients on high flow or BiPAP before they're intubated? No, uh, I know that there's, there's some small amount of evidence of observational studies where you can have non-intubated patients uh, lay on their stomach for, uh, a, a, for a prolonged period and basically do the same thing you do for intubated patients. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a hypothesis that that may help patients. It's just yet to be proven in a large randomized trial. And so I'm not at all opposed to doing that for patients. Uh, what, what I hesitate with is uh, our, our nurses are a, a valuable and precious resource. And I want our nurses focused on, on doing perfectly the things that we know work, the things that we have lots of high quality evidence to support the, those practices. I want our nurses and doctors focused uh, completely on that stuff and, and try not to have them spend a lot of time and get distracted on things that just are still in the hypothesis range and have yet to be proven in large randomized trials. So, so I'm not opposed to patients sleeping on their stomach when they're not intubated, um, but uh, I, it, it'd be difficult to operationalize that and use our nursing resources to say, we should apply that across the entire system. Makes sense. Um, the next, and you touched on this a little bit with BiPAP and high flow nasal cannula. Um, a lot of people around the country due to lack of PPE are really, seems to be hesitant to use these. Um, and BiPAP, that makes sense. Are you, are you concerned at all with high flow nasal cannula spreading the disease or is there any way to mitigate that? Yeah, when we, uh, and anecdotally, the evidence to use, I, before I, I say my anecdote, let's talk about the evidence first with high flow. So there is some evidence in the, what was called the, the Florali trial. Um, this was in patients with pneumonia, um, with pneumonia who presented the ED and they're hypoxemic. And the question is, how do you support their hypoxemia prior to intubating them? Those patients got randomized to a non-rebreather, high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP. And actually there's a survival benefit of all three of those groups. There's a survival benefit with using high flow nasal cannula in those patients who present to the ED with pneumonia um, and who are hypoxemic. So in that trial, um, high flow nasal cannula uh, was the winner because there is a survival benefit. Now, uh, that's the evidence. And the evidence on the back end, too, is there are randomized trials of using uh, a high flow on the back end to extubate patients, too, so you don't have to reintubate them. And there's some evidence that it prevents reintubation. Now, aside from that evidence, anecdotally, uh, me and others so far have been somewhat unimpressed by the performance of high flow, specifically in COVID ARDS. Um, and not because of this whole viral shedding issue and dispersion, uh, because in, this, in COVID ARDS, at least anecdotally, these patients seem to have a marked amount of atelectasis associated with their ARDS, where they, they just tend to not do all that well when they don't have some amount of positive pressure applied either with a BiPAP or CPAP machine or with an endotracheal tube on a ventilator. Uh, and they, they almost all require some small amount of positive pressure to get them through this 
and positive pressure that just uh, can't be done with high flow. High flow will provide maybe about three of, of PEEP, but it just isn't enough to prevent the atelectasis that these patients have. And so I've had patients who are doing okay on high flow, but they just kind of linger on the high flow and don't get better, uh, don't, don't make good progress. And then we're having to do other stuff to help uh, treat their atelectasis, like mobilizing them, doing physical therapy, getting them out of the bed, using easy PAP valves, or just giving up on the high flow altogether and using CPAP or BiPAP to help them with this, this marked amount of atelectasis with this illness. If we use high flow to your question of making it safe, we uh, do all the things that we can to try to make this safe, like doing it in negative pressure rooms, putting a surgical mask on, on, on the patient that goes over the high flow device, uh, the healthcare providers wearing their airborne and droplet and contact precautions when they're in the room with their N95 masks, for example. Uh, so, uh, so being responsible with this device uh, and uh, protecting our healthcare providers but this is, this is an illness, and again, the Society of Critical Care Medicine guidelines for treating patients with COVID still includes using all of these type of oxygen support devices in patients. They do not recommend getting rid of any of these devices. Uh, so this, is, this practice is all within guideline recommendations, and it, it makes sense here. If there's gonna be a pandemic with thousands and thousands of critically ill adults uh, that statement just doesn't fit with we're going to completely take one auction or multiple auction support devices out of the game completely. It, there isn't a model here where we're going to intubate every patient just on six liters nasal cannula because if we did that on a good day, um, our ICUs would be full. If we did that now, our ICUs would be, would be overwhelmed uh, with patients who were perhaps inappropriately intubated. And so we just can't take devices completely out of the game here, but we can be safe with them and thoughtful and make sure that, uh, that we're using them in, a, in, a safe, in the safest way possible. Great. Um, next question, and this is kind of on the same line, what um, is your threshold to intubate and put these patients on the vent so to move on from BiPAP? Do you have anything specific or is it clinical course or? Yeah, so we, it's been seen by a lot of people that these patients will, when they present, they'll only require two liters nasal cannula, uh, but then this rapid respiratory failure progression where then the next hour, they're up to eight liters nasal cannula, the hour after that, they're on a non-rebreather mask, and this rapid progression of hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, uh, we've all seen that, and that's made lots of us worry that maybe we should just intubate these patients immediately um, amongst this rapid progression, which I don't think is, is a wrong answer because it's, it's somewhat scary when you see that. But I think the cause of that rapid progression, like I said before, I think the cause of it is because this illness, this COVID ARDS, is associated with a marked amount of atelectasis that just isn't overcome with a nasal cannula or a non-rebreather mask. And those patients, if positive pressure is never applied to them, uh, those patients will have rapid, rapidly progressive respiratory failure and will likely need to be intubated. Uh, and so, so our approach in the ICU is we recognize that, that this patient has rapidly progressive respiratory failure. Instead of trying to uh, then just immediately intubating the patient then we'd try to apply some positive pressure like with BiPAP or CPAP and see if that, if that slows down this progression or stops this progression. And like I said, in, in a good group of patients, it does. And that's all the patients need to help them through their, their ICU course is a little bit of positive pressure with CPAP or BiPAP. Now, that's not, I understand, that's not operational in every clinical setting. So in the ED, when these patients are coming in quickly, uh, there's lots of them. There isn't time to, to try to get a, a CPAP or BiPAP machine and apply it. There isn't time to, uh, to see if they're gonna respond to, to that therapy. Completely agree. If this is just rapidly falling apart from hypoxemic respiratory failure, it is not wrong to intubate that patient uh, and 
the clinician at the bedside is the one is the right person to make that judgment of is this just rapidly falling apart and is there time or not to even give a little bit of positive pressure a try before intubating the patient um, but again another device where if we're going to say we're dealing with a pandemic that's going to cause lots of critical illness um, we just can't take that device out of the game completely we have to figure out a way to to get that device in the game use it smartly and safely um, and like I said, in our experience, it's been working. Do you have any idea of our, our vent days on our COVID patients? Do you think, are they a little less? Are they a little more? Like, do you think you're actually saving vent days by this approach? Yeah, all I can, all I can do is compare to historical controls outside of Louisiana that have been published in the literature. So for example, the Washington State experience with this illness, with COVID ARDS, their average time of requiring intubation uh, was in the two week range. Um, and then patients, patients died or they got better uh, and were able to be extubated, but their average time in the ventilator was around two weeks. Uh, I'd say of our patients who've survived this illness, um, the longest patient we've had on the ventilator was 12 days, the patient got extubated and survived. But I'd say on average, our patients will stay on the ventilator more in the range of three to five days, and then are, are well enough by that point that we can uh, safely extubate them, for example, to BiPAP. And again, uh, uh, it's, th there's problems with using historical controls. There's problems with comparing our patients in our, in our system to patients and systems in a completely different state on the other side of the country. It is, it is an apples to oranges comparison, um, but at least in that comparison, uh, we have, our experience has been much quicker resolution of their ARDS and hypoxic respiratory failure. And again, all, not because we've, we've tried some experimental drug and we've discovered the miracle cure for this problem, but only because we've just been incredibly focused and in, in trying to be as perfect as possible with applying evidence-based medicine for the syndrome that this infection causes. Yeah, and that kind of follows our data modeling as well, because we, at this point, expected to be using more vents at our hospital and across our system, as well as have more ICU patients. And we've already started to see a little leveling off. And I think it's because of our lower ventilator times, which has been very helpful as a system in a hospital to manage this disease. Um, you mentioned some of the medicines. Can you, I mean, anecdotally share your experience with the different Plaquenil, azithromycin? Um, I know you touched on a couple of them, but anything? Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll list for you medicines that have been talked about in the literature and the press uh, about using to treat this, specifically this viral infection. Um, medicines like hydroxychloroquine, um, uh, remdesivir, uh, corticosteroids in them of themselves to treat uh, this viral infection. Uh, tocilizumab um, are just a, a handful of medicines that have been talked about. Azithromycin is on that list. Um, not as the treatment for community acquired pneumonia, which would be appropriate, but as a treatment for specifically for this viral infection. Um, those are all things that have been talked about. Some people have tried them. Uh, again, none of those things have any high quality evidence to support their use. And, and personally, I believe that, that lots of time and effort spent on thinking about those things distracts us from good evidence-based medicine, being, being perfect at adhering to evidence-based practices that you see on the screen here. And I, I worry about, about lots of time spent on medicines that we have no idea if they work and not spending lots of time on evidence-based medicine. We have used some of those medicines that I've just listed. Uh, anecdotally, I'm completely unimpressed by, uh, by their effectiveness, if there's any effectiveness at all in treating these patients. Um, there's lots of patients who we've stopped these medicines because, uh, or never started them because, again, we have no idea if there's benefit to these medicines. All we know is there may be risk 
to these medicines. And so we make that when we make that risk benefit calculation, all we know is is no known benefit and some risk. And these pay, these medicines aren't without side effects that can sometimes be life threatening side effects. Uh, and so there are patients that we haven't started it in because the risk is too high. There's patients that we've stopped these medicines on because the, the risk is too high or they're causing a side effect. And uh, anecdotally, uh, those patients all do just as well. If, uh, if even though we've either not started or stopped those medicines because we try to apply the, these other evidence-based interventions uniformly to all patients, and these patients do, do uh, just as well. Uh, what RICU is participating in, which uh, we are an academic medical center, we're uh, a research hospital, we want to know the answer eventually to the question of do any of these medicines work? Uh, so we're uh, actively and enthusiastically engaged in randomized trials of uh, most of these medicines that I just listed there because uh, what, uh, in my opinion, what we in the entire world should be working on is comparing these medicines to, uh, to no treatment and answering the question of for everyone to know uh, for the future because this is this pandemic is going to be going on for months to years. We need to know the answer, these medicines work or not. Uh, I've been around long enough in critical care and have experienced pandemics and epidemics before in critical care uh, where we've used these medicines, just, just making a guess that they may work, not these the medicines I listed to you, but past other quote unquote experimental therapies. Uh, and not only have they, some of them not worked at all, the most common scenario is they just don't work at all. Sometimes they actually end up being harmful when we actually study them. Uh, so um, uh, we want to learn the answer to do these medicines work. We, the way we want to learn that answer is not just random bedside use based on the doctor's bedside picking. Uh, we want to learn if these medicines work by, by participating in high quality randomized trials and answering the question for the entire world of whether or not we should be using them at all. Yeah. Um, and then on your Lasix diuresis, um, when and how early can you start that? Because um, there's, a, I know there's some evidence for starting it before intubation at any sign of pulmonary edema. Is that when you're dosing the 40 times their creatinine or are you waiting until they're intubated? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, it, so the purist would say if you're going to strictly adhere to the fact trial uh, data, uh, that this that these data only apply to intubated patients with ARDS who are not in shock, who are not on vasopressors. That was the fact trial. Uh, I and lots of people extrapolate those data to other patient populations. So, for example, the intubated patient who is in shock but just on some low dose of vasopressor or decreasing dose of vasopressor, uh, we will actually start trying to diurese that patient if they're just on a little bit of vasopressor, making the assumption that their shock is not hypovolemic, that probably a lot of their shock in that scenario is just the massive amount of sedative drugs that we're having to infuse into them to keep them asleep and safe in the setting of refractory hypoxemia so that it perhaps may not even be shock at all. So in the intubated patient with no shock or just a very mild uh, vasopressor requirement, we start trying to diurese that patient. But admitting it's, that's an extrapolation of the fact trial data, your patient population that, that you asked about, the non-intubated patient before they get intubated or the ones that never get intubated, again, there has never been a randomized trial of that patient population of diuresis versus not, but lots of us do still extrapolate the fact trial data. That patient population and yes, as long as they don't have signs of marked uh, volume depletion, as long as they uh, don't have progressive or refractory shock, uh, even when non intubated, we're just supporting them with BiPAP, for example, uh, we will start diuresing that patient as soon as when they show up to the intensive care unit. So we'll start as early as ICU day zero. And you're doing the same dose of 40 times their creatinine BID? Correct. Now, these patients, uh, 
like I said before, uh, we've cr this is we've created a system that uh, provides that is able is manageable critical care is what I call it. Meaning we can handle the influx of patients, we can handle how severe they ill ill they are. But like I said, uh, we despite all of our best efforts, we can't fix everyone that comes in the ICU, uh, and there are. A, 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 number of people who will die from this illness despite our best efforts. And in our experience, uh, the way that lots of folks, lots of folks uh, die from this illness um, despite trying to get them better is uh, when they develop acute kidney injury and acute renal failure and eventually develop aneuric renal failure. Um, there has, there is, is always worry about giving Lasix to patients who have acute kidney injury. There is no evidence that that is harmful to patients. There is no evidence that in a patient who you have diagnosed with volume excess, that giving that patient Lasix in the setting of acute kidney injury will cause worsening acute kidney injury. Of course, if you give Lasix to a patient who's hypovolemic, who needs volume resuscitation, everyone agrees that's not good. You shouldn't give Lasix to a patient where your clinical impression is they have hypovolemia, especially hypovolemic shock. But if your impression is that this patient is volume excess and they have organ edema from their volume excess, like pulmonary edema, which ARDS is a type of pulmonary edema, uh, where they're dying from hypoxic respiratory failure, even in the setting of having acute kidney injury, uh, we give that patient Lasix. Uh, because if we don't, they will get net positive a liter a day and then they will die from hypoxic respiratory failure or never get intubated, get extubated. So, uh, uh, and again, that's exactly what occurred in the FACT trial. So in patients in the FACT trial, even if they had acute kidney injury, uh, those patients kept getting diuresis until you achieved uh, the goal of extubating that patient. Um, uh, it, so there, there isn't evidence that giving these patients Lasix causes harm to them. It, there isn't any evidence that it causes worsening kidney injury or renal failure. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that this infection, that, that COVID, uh, it's, not, it's not just an infection of the lungs causing ARDS. It does clearly cause a sepsis syndrome that causes acute kidney injury and renal failure. Um, and unfortunately, that when it progresses to annual failure, and patients need things like dialysis, and we've done all our best efforts to try to get these, these patients who have volume excess, try to get them to urinate out that volume with Lasix. Uh, unfortunately, that is just a bad prognostic sign for them, that, um, that aneuric renal failure is uh, something that is gonna be very difficult for the patient to recover from. And for our, I mean, ED docs and hospitalists, they generally aren't treating ARDS. Um, and I think the evidence is good for a net negative fluid balance in ARDS. Um, that would be probably the recommendation in the floor and from the ED is to try to maintain the net negative fluid balance because of the pulmonary edema that would worsen ARDS. Yeah, so I, I think this all starts with making a, a thoughtful bedside judgment as to what volume status is this patient? Is, does this patient have marked signs of hypovolemia that should be treated with, with balanced crystalloid fluid resuscitation? Uh, are they euvolemic or are they hypervolemic? And again, uh, volume can exist both intravascularly and extravascularly causing organ edema. And organ edema, even if a patient uh, is not, doesn't have volume excess intravascularly, and it's just volume excess in an organ, that can be markedly life-threatening and, and requires us to get volume out of that patient. And so in the ED and on the floor, I think the bedside providers should make uh, a clinical judgment about what is the volume status of my patient? Do they have organ edema that is life-threatening? And if the answer is yes, uh, and there isn't, there isn't some obvious reason to say diuresing that patient would be unsafe, uh, then at least a, a net even fluid balance, if not net negative, uh, with, by extrapolating the data from the FACT trial, uh, may perhaps uh, prevent worsening illness and prevent critical illness 
in these patients. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't apply it across the board that when everyone hits the door with, with COVID and they look like they have ARDS, that the first thing you should do is just give all those patients a big dose of Lasix because I think the first thing you, we should do is make a judgment on their volume status. And then based on that, proceed. Because it is also true, lots of these patients have been sick at home for a week before they come to the ED uh, and not eating and drinking because they've just been feeling too lousy. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable it, within that scenario where your impression is they have volume depletion that with balanced crystalloid fluids that uh, you volume resuscitate them, but just don't volume resuscitate them day after day after day because we know that if uh, that they're going to get volume resuscitated, quote unquote, regardless just by the meds and uh, other other interventions that get infused into them. Um, they're going to get volume that way anyway as the days go on. Just utilizing our normal, you know, ultrasound for pulmonary edema, IVC status still. Correct. Care is how we should be evaluating these patients. Completely agree. Yep. That I think answers all my questions. Um, thank you so much for this. This is amazing, and we're going to work on getting this out.